guys, welcome to a video, and in today's video, we're just going to be doing a deep dive into lesbianism that's so dreamy in the hit TV slash horror show that is Glee. I've been feeling for a while that I had to make this video deep in my soul because whilst Glee wasn't perfect, it really did come through with the lesbian representation. In fact, the show was groundbreaking in terms of on-screen lesbian representation because it had such widespread appeal, especially in comparison to something such as The L Word, which was much more niche and definitely aimed at a more adult audience. So Glee stands out because it brought gay and lesbian issues into the mainstream. It promoted a strong message of acceptance. And I think it's fair to say that it had a positive impact on gay and lesbian rights. I think the show really changed a lot of hearts and minds for the better. Even if the jokes about scissoring got tired very quickly. Glee was a cultural phenomenon and being a lesbian in the fandom in the early 2010s was just, it was a wild time. The fan fiction, the fan art, the manipulating certain scenes so it looked like Rachel and Quinn were kissing. Oh yeah, the GIF wizards, I remember that. Oh, even I wrote fan fiction about this show. Oh my God. The fandom was huge and gays, lesbians, and anybody even remotely fruity flocked there because of all the representation. It's both fun and frightening to look back on it. I also don't think that all the sapphic elements in Glee have ever been discussed in detail in one place. So that's what we're doing today. The two relationships I'm going to be discussing in this video are the two biggest lesbian ships on the show. Brittany and Santana, who were canon and a really important piece of on-screen lesbian representation. And Rachel and Quinn, who were not canon, but the chemistry, the connection, the lesbian subtext between the two of them. Insert Lady Gaga meme right here. Now I'm going to start this video off with a little bit of tea or fun fact which give the relationships I'm talking about a bit more context. The first thing and perhaps the biggest thing to know is that the writers never initially intended for Britney and Santana to be in a serious relationship. Britney and Santana very much started out as this quirky, hot, lesbian cheerleaders joke type situation. And even that was reined in due to concerns over gay content by the network. Naya Rivera, who sadly passed away in 2020, actually spoke about this in an interview where she said, it started off as this funny little thing, like, oh yeah, she just randomly hooks up with her friend Britney, Rivera explained but I was kind of encouraging them to make it more serious and not play around with it. Because there are people out there that it's not a joke to. It's their real lives. Naya also discusses the relationship in her book, Sorry Not Sorry, where she recalls how early depictions of Santana and Britney's relationship served as queer bait. She says that she and Britney were only allowed quick pecks on screen because the writers had to assure the network that they were just dipping their toes in the gay pool. Her book reads, like many things that went on to become major plot lines on Glee, Britney and Santana's relationship started out as a joke. Late one season, Britney made reference to the fact that she and Santana had hooked up. It was a casual line and later I asked Brad Falchuk, who'd written the episode, if Britney and Santana really had a thing. Well, I don't know, he said. But when he came back from hiatus, he'd figured it out. Santana was a lesbian. At first, I was just happy that she was getting a storyline because, hello, more screen time for me. But as that story progressed, we all started to see how much it was resonating with people. It was no longer a joke or a way to spice things up, but something that we should take seriously. As each new episode aired, I would get tweets from people thanking me and telling me how important the storyline was to them. The writers would get similar praise and also the occasional death threat from a lesbian warning them that they better not mess this up. I think we did a pretty good job. Santana and Brittany were able to show that a gay relationship was just that, a relationship with no no less or more of the ups and downs that happen in any relationship. 
So it's very telling that Kurt's whole gay storyline was taken very seriously from the get-go, but the lesbianism in Glee started out as a joke. And only later on was it taken seriously, in part thanks to Naya herself. In fairness to the writers, they had to work around, I think it's fair to say, a homophobic network at the time, which did impact the lesbian representation. But like I said, if you compare it to the way that Kurt's storyline was treated from the get-go, there's a clear difference in intention there. In fact, Naya has briefly discussed some of her discomfort about the writing surrounding Britanna in her book. But as their relationship progressed, hookup scenes with Heather could be pretty uncomfortable, though she never spit on me, especially when we were supposed to be in love with a capital L, making out, and then dropping jokes like, oh ha ha, isn't scissoring just great? And at this point, Heather was a mum. I know that some people read this extract as Naya saying she was uncomfortable with the kissing scenes, but the way that I read it is it's more about her being uncomfortable about the way Britanna are written as opposed to her being uncomfortable over kissing Heather. It sounds to me like she wanted to take the relationship between Britney and Santana seriously and she was trying to act out this relationship where these two girls were very much in love but all the writers wanted to do was make jokes about scissoring and even if it was supposed to be funny at the beginning it's like they weren't ever allowed to move past the kind of comedic aspect of it and that just became weird you know whilst I can appreciate what Glee did for lesbian representation I can also acknowledge that a lot of the writing surrounding the lesbian representation was garbage Sometimes it was funny garbage, but garbage nonetheless. The second thing is that Leah Michelle and Diana Agron, who play Rachel Berry and Quinn Fabray, used to live with each other and had a very deep, real life connection, which was plain for everybody to see. They also had a lot of shippers. They did. I don't know if it was ever romantic. There's never been an official confirmation. Just the rumours. But I mention it because their real life connection undoubtedly played into the chemistry between the characters that they played. And the whole Faberry ship is quite literally built on that. The writers definitely played into that connection later on, probably as a result of the very obvious chemistry and all the relentless shipping. My god. But the point is, much like Britanna, that's not what the writers had initially intended for their characters. They did not plan for the chemistry. In fact, Ryan Murphy spoke about Quinn as a character in an interview with the Rolling Stone, where he said, When we cast Diana as Quinn, she ruined the part for me. She was supposed to be the Sybil Shepherd, last picture show C-word, so to speak, but she humanised it. She can cry at the drop of a hat. So now her character has a conscience, a soul, and a great vulnerability. I've always found this quote very odd because it reads like both an insult and a compliment. I think it's also very telling about the way he viewed women at that time and the female characters he created as a result of those views. I do feel like he's kind of redeemed himself since then with the way that he writes women and their relationships with each other, probably due to the relentless backlash he used to get. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the point is he never initially intended for Quinn to be anything more than this two-dimensional cliche of a popular bitchy high schooler. But it was Diana who brought depth to that character. And it was Diana and Leah who brought that intense connection between Quinn and Rachel. So neither of the lesbian ships on Glee were intentional from the beginning. Both of these ships happened as a result of other things, which is interesting. Now let's get into it. <laughs> So at the beginning, Brittany and Santana are essentially just fooling around with each other, and Santana is deep in gay denial about her true feelings for Brittany. 
she constantly deflects or brushes things off as not that deep between them. Brittany is the only one who wants to talk about what's happening with their relationship and honestly, if it wasn't for Brittany pushing for Santana to talk about how she really feels, who knows if Santana would have ever come out of the closet. Rewatching this show, one thing that struck me was just how incredible the portrayal of Santana coming to terms with her sexuality was, and also how much care the writers took with that arc after it had initially been introduced as a joke. Their portrayal of Santana dealing with her sexuality was realistic and relatable. From her initial denial of her sexuality and attachment to heteronormativity, to her fear of what everyone would think and letting that shape her decisions. Naya's performance throughout Santana coming to terms with her sexuality is incredible. There's a real emotional rawness in all of her scenes, particularly the scenes in which she sings Songbird and Mine to Britney. Those two scenes are just brimming with an emotional vulnerability between the two of them and it's really touching. I had also forgotten how hilarious Britney and Santana were together. Naya and Heather have such great comedic timing and you could just tell they had so much fun filming a lot of their scenes together. There is an obvious lack of physical affection between Brittany and Santana, especially in the earlier seasons. We were lucky to get crumbs at all, but re-watching it with the knowledge that the network, essentially being homophobic, was the reason for that, the lack of it makes a lot more sense. The worst part about Santana's coming out arc was absolutely Finn outing her and his behaviour in general towards her. I had forgotten just how disgusting him outing her was and how annoying he was with his I know best attitude. And yes, Santana was also toxic towards Finn at times. She wasn't always a wholesome cinnamon roll, but no one deserves to be outed because of how serious the consequences of that can be. And then on top of that, Finn kept pressuring her. It really irritated me how he became so controlling and pushy about her coming out and wouldn't let her move at her own pace. The whole thing was just really gross. Of course, when Santana does decide to come out to her grandmother, it doesn't go well at all. This scene is probably one of the most heartbreaking and raw scenes on Glee. But the speech Santana gives in this scene is powerful because she's not just speaking for herself, she's also speaking on behalf of thousands of lesbian and queer women around the world. I love girls the way that I'm supposed to feel about boys. Her grandmother's negative reaction is also a stark contrast to how accepting Kurt's father is of his son's sexuality. And I think Lee did a good job of portraying both sides of what can happen when you come out. That sometimes it is received in a positive and supportive way, but sometimes it's not. The show portrayed that Santana was not just battling with self-acceptance, she was battling with other people's acceptance as well, which was important to see represented on screen, because so many gay, lesbian and bisexual people go through that exact journey. One of the things I really appreciate looking back on Glee is the strong message of love is love that they promoted. And with the show's massive influence, it definitely changed a lot of hearts and minds where gay and lesbian acceptance is concerned. And this was in a time before gay marriage was legal. And it wasn't just the way the writers wrote the storylines or the characters. There were lots of little things the show did as well. For example, when they swapped male pronouns for female ones in the Whitney Houston's I Wanna Dance With Somebody number, which of course was a nod to the fact that Whitney Houston was bisexual, a fact that's often left out of the discourse around her, and I felt like Glee was honouring that just by making those small changes. And it's plain to see why the show was so beloved and had such a huge following of gay, lesbian and bisexual people. I think that's why when Britanna broke up, it was rough. 
they meant so much and represented so much to so many people. They were a beacon of hope in a lot of ways and so for the writers to take that away, even temporarily, of course there was going to be a negative reaction. I can't blame the fandom for being very sour towards Ryan Murphy in that period. Oh, I was there for it and he was pretty awful towards lesbian fans in that period, but that's for another time. Anyway, it's one thing to tear Britney and Santana apart, but it's another thing entirely to put Britney together with Sam, when no one wanted or asked for that. What? was the reason. I mean, it felt like they were just put together for the sake of it. And honestly, with the way Ryan Murphy was behaving towards fans on social media in that period, it also felt a little bit antagonistic. Although as a silver lining, it did make me laugh that there were some clear parallels between Santana not wanting Britney to date Sam and Quinn not wanting Rachel to date Finn because of quote unquote reasons. When in truth, it's because Santana wanted Britney to her Herself, and Quinn wanted Rachel to herself. I said what I said. In terms of Santana's side chicks, because let's be real, Britney was always the wife, even during their breakup. I'm not sure Elaine is really worth discussing since Santana paid her to act as her girlfriend. Sparkle emoji. I mean, we did get some angst out of that situation and Britney also cared enough to do some digging and find out that the relationship was fake, but still, it wasn't actually a relationship, so we'll just move on to Danny and Santana instead. Now, I didn't hate this ship since I appreciate all contributions to lesbian science and Santana's gay panic was really adorable to watch. But I feel like the writing around the brief quote-unquote relationship that Danny and Santana had was a little rushed, ridiculous, and very surface level. To be fair, they didn't have a lot of screen time together, which didn't help matters. And obviously, it was never going to be more than a brief distraction from Britanna, who were always going to be endgame, but still. As soon as Britney came back into the picture, Danny was immediately forgotten about and just gone with the sands of time. We're still not sure if Santana was the one who broke up with Danny, or if Danny was the one who broke up with Santana. Might have been nice to have some closure. The writers could have done a lot more with this ship, even if it was only temporary, but whatever, this is the writers for Glee we're talking about, so it's better to just be realistic. (laughs) Of course, thankfully, Britanna do get back together. Ryan Murphy was probably so scared for his life, there wasn't really another option. And I have to say, the Britanna getting back together arc is one of my favourites. From the upgraded kisses, to the lesbian flowers, to the tickets to Lesbos, all of it is poetic cinema. It definitely seemed like the writers were given much more leeway for Britney and Santana to be more physically affectionate in the later scenes seasons. But also, I think you could just tell that the connection had grown between Naya and Heather as well, which is why I prefer Britannia's later interactions a lot more to their earlier ones. There's just a bit more to them. Naya actually discusses one of the later kisses between them in her book, where she says, The biggest kiss we ever had was in a scene right before Santana and Britney's wedding, where the stage direction in the script said something like, They share a kiss they can't have in front of everyone else. Brad Buker, who was directing the episode, came up to us beforehand and gave us this bit of direction. You know, he said, just really go at it. I guess I did it right because my mum screamed when she watched the episode and thought I had really stuck my tongue down Heather's throat. FYI, I didn't. The trick is, you go in with an open mouth and close it as soon as you make contact. So the director telling them to quote-unquote go at it is proof that things had progressed past the quick pecs they were allowed to have at the beginning of the show, which we all appreciated very much, for purely scientific reasons. And to be fair, despite some of the garbage writing and the endless scissoring jokes, Glee gave us a proper Britney and Santana endgame. No one died, no one left anyone for a man. We got a proposal, we got a wedding, and we got a happily ever after. That's a lot more than most on-screen lesbian couples get, even today. 
I mean, no, it wasn't really believable that Santana would have agreed to a double gay wedding with Kurt and Blaine, but hey, I'll take the lesbian win anyway. The double wedding was very much giving, oh, let's just chuck both the gay weddings together and wrap it up quickly, rather than taking the time to celebrate those couples separately, energy. But like I said, it's better than a lot of other endings that lesbian or gay on-screen couples get and I'll take the gay lesbian double wedding win. Moving on to Rachel and Quinn. Now, these two were not canon, but my God, the subtext, the angst and the longing between them was off the charts. These two had more chemistry than any other of the couples on Glee, canon or not. And they were an extra gift from Zeus to the lesbians alongside Brittany and Santana. As a fun fact, the role of Quinn Fabray was not cast until the night before filming began, and they very nearly got rid of her character altogether. So it really is lucky that we got Fabray as a ship at all. A not so fun fact is before offering Diana the part of Quinn, who was a high schooler, the production was worried she may appear too innocent and asked her to come back looking sexier, which is of course pretty horrifying. Diana later said that this request was like hearing nails on a chalkboard. Hmm. But a deep dive into the misogyny and glee is for another video. One that would probably be 17 hours long. So Quinn Fabray very much starts out as this caricature of your typical two-dimensional bitchy popular high schooler who obsessively has it out for Rachel Berry who is an unpopular, uptight theatre kid, and it's total fanfiction material from the get-go. Even though the writers set it up so that Quinn's rivalry with Rachel largely revolved around Finn, it honestly never read to me that he was really the source of their friction. It always seemed to me like there was something more personal going on in their interactions, and like Quinn almost had an obsession with Rachel, but didn't know how to express her feelings, and so bullied her instead to get her attention. Barry would just be minding her own business and Quinn would appear out of nowhere to try and ruffle her feathers. Every two seconds. It was very much giving, bullying your crush because you can't admit your real feelings. I feel like the drawing of Barry surrounded by love hearts and the pornographic pictures in the bathroom, both created by Quinn, very much support this theory. All Rachel and Quinn would do throughout the show was use Finn as ammunition against each other and seemed more interested in how they could use him to score points instead of wanting a genuine relationship with him. And I'm not saying that Finn and Rachel didn't have any chemistry or that they had no connection because they absolutely did. But it was nowhere near as charged as Rachel's connection and chemistry with Quinn. Perhaps because there was also that antagonistic element between them which gave it that edge. You know, the back and forth between Rachel and Quinn is very reminiscent of an old married couple. And to add to that, the way they sing to one another with passion, the longing stares, especially in their duet of I feel pretty, unpretty, the making eye babies with each other, and the fact that they consistently emotionally ruin each other and have tears in their eyes whenever they really get into it, makes their relationship much more layered and intense than all the other relationships on Glee combined. You can just tell there's a whole other conversation going on between them, other than what they're actually saying to each other. The lesbian longing was intense. Portrait of a lady on fire, old and shaking. And there are so many examples of this intensity and longing between the two of them. You're right. I I've helped you not because it's the right thing to do, but because I had romantic ulterior motives. And I practice a little bit more because you obviously have a lot you need to express. Oh, you have no idea. Wait, do you not understand what you mean to me? Stop making out with Barry and get to the Spanish room, Quinn. It's time to count the votes and declare me the winner. Finn asked me to marry him. Well, you can't. What? Quinn, that's amazing. That's so great. <laughs> I got one for me into New York. You know, everybody keeps talking about staying in touch, and 
I want to make sure that we do. You don't think people whisper about me in the lunchrooms or draw pornographic pictures of me on the bathroom walls? That was me, actually. It's not over between yes, us. Yes, it is! You're so frustrating! So, so what's it like? Looking like you look. That's not true! Okay, I've tried to reason with you. I've even tried to be nice about it, but I'm not gonna stand around and watch you ruin your life by marrying Finn Hudson. Rachel, we gotta go right now. We're gonna lose our slot. Can we please just wait a couple moments for Quinn, please? It's now or never. When you were singing that song, you were singing it to Finn, and only Finn, right? <laughs> There is no heterosexual explanation for that. I also think it's worth mentioning the classic traditional mask and femme for Berry aesthetics we got with Quinn in a tux and Berry in a dress. I don't know if these aesthetics were intentional, but all I'm saying is the shoe fits. Speaking of life-changing aesthetics, Skank Quinn is also worthy of a mention. Since it was A, a cultural reset, B, Quinn breaking free from convention, heteronormative expectations, and was also her soft coming out all in one, and C, made for some great for Berry fan fiction material. I will briefly mention the Quinn and Santana hookup here since it's canon, but really I always viewed it as a consolation prize to the lesbian fans who didn't get there for Berry endgame. It felt like the writers were like, here, have some canon queer Quinn crumbs instead of what you really want. I couldn't get you a puppy, but look, Here's a shiny rock instead. And so there's a slight bitterness surrounding this hookup for me. And also just the way it was written. For example, when Quinn was like, I've always wondered what it was like to be with a woman, but I don't know, I think it's just more of a one-time thing for me. But then she immediately takes Santana up on the offer of it being a two-time thing. Make it make sense. It's like the writers hadn't even watched their own show at this point, because Quinn has been heavily sapphic coded from early on. I mean, I don't hate this scene because it is a contribution to lesbian science, and I'm a simple lesbian. But the way it was written just, it made no sense. Which, to be fair, is signature to this show. So, I think the way for Berry were written, particularly when the writers became aware of the chemistry between the actors and all the shipping in the fandom, was highly suggestive. And I think the writers purposely added an ambiguity to the true nature of their relationship. I also think it's fair to say that Quinn's romantic feelings for Rachel are canon, even if their relationship wasn't. I just don't think there's any other reasonable interpretations of her behaviour towards Rachel or the things that she says to her, aside from a romantic one. But canon or not canon, the chemistry between Rachel and Quinn is what makes for Berry the superior glee ship. It was all in the eyes. The Suffolk intensity could set entire cities ablaze. I think it's a shame that Faberry were never endgame, but it's not exactly a surprise. Two female leads ending up together is just not going to happen on a popular network show that is trying to cater to a largely heteronormative society, particularly in the early 2010s. And I think overall, considering what the writers were allowed to do in terms of lesbian representation under the network at the time, and despite all of its flaws, Glee really went above and beyond with the positive representation representation and with promoting a message of gay and lesbian acceptance. And even though the writing is highly questionable and garbage in some places, it's still a very entertaining show which did incredible things and gave us a lot. It's both fun and frightening to look back on. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's a throwback, but I felt it deep within my soul that it should be made. Zeus came to me in a dream and asked me to make it. If you have any thoughts on the lesbianism in Glee, please leave them down in the comments section below, especially if you have any tea. If you want to support lesbian content and 
women's voices. Oh, come and join the Sapphic Underground Club. Just come and join it. It prevents me from running away to live in the woods. <laughs> I, I will live in a tent and I will let my life fall to ruin. And if you know me, you know that's not a joke. So there you go. Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye.